Ah, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm I'm in the live mode. It shows I'm online. Uh, I welcome you all uh, to the sixth B session of the sixth C conference <coughs> on thermochemical processes for biomass. For the session, we have uh, moderators Professor Vinod K. Gar and Professor Sai Yu. In this session, uh, we have panelists. Professor Bhaskar Gurunathan, Professor Lam, Dr. Sarvana Murugan, Professor Park, Dr. Richa Kukhari, Dr. Ashokumar Viramuthu, and Professor Adam Rene. Now, I first introduce our uh, moderator of the session, Professor Vinod Kumar Gar. Professor Vinod Kumar is presently working at the Department of Environmental Science and Technology, Central University of Punjab, India. He is a well-rounded researcher with more than 30 years of experience in leading, supervising and undertaking research in the field of water and wastewater management, solid and hazardous waste management. He and his research group is working on the water and wastewater pollution monitoring and abatement, solid waste management, pesticide degradation, heavy metal detoxification. He has published more than 200 research and zero articles, 22 proceedings, and uh, he is having an edge index of 65. In addition, he has published two books and two book chapters and completed 10 sponsored research projects as a principal investigator, which were funded by various agencies and departments. He was awarded as Thomson Reuters Research Excellence India Citation Awards 2012. He is an active member of various scientific societies and organizations, including the Biotech Research Society India, the Indian Nuclear Society, and so on. Now, we have a co-moderator of the session, Dr. Simon Liu. Dr. Simon Liu, lecturer in the Jet Ford School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow, UK. He is specialized in the design and analysis of environmental and energy systems, which focus on wastewater treatment and waste management systems. Before joining the school, he worked as a research fellow at NUS Singapore Environmental Research Institute. He also served as a postdoctoral fellow at Nanyang Technological University in 2015. Dr. Yu received his PhD in thermofluids from Nanyang Technical University in 2014. 
He has published over 70 papers in peer reviewed journals and served as a keynote or invited speaker at 15 international conferences. Dr. Yu was awarded as the Outstanding Young Researcher Award by the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, SLS, in 2018. Now I request Professor Vinod Kegar uh, for the further proceedings of this session. Thank you, Dr. Sunita, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. So, uh, the first talk will be by Professor Lam Su Xiong. Professor Lam holds PhD in Chemical Engineering from Cambridge University and is currently Professor of the Institute of Tropical Aquaculture and Fisheries of University Malaysia. He is serving as editor of Environmental Pollution and associate editor for reviews of uh, environmental contamination and toxicology, environmental advances, environmental geochemistry and health, etc. He is having a very, very active research group that is mainly working on waste and biomass utilization, waste and wastewater treatment, green technology, etc. So, Dr. Lam, I invite you to share your views. Please uh, keep in mind the time limit of 8 to 9 minutes. Dr. Lam, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Prof and also thank you to, uh, to the organizer for inviting me. So please uh, uh, please allow me to share my slides. Can I share my slides or you will share my slides? Yeah. Yeah, we are able to see your slides. Perfect. You go ahead. Uh, I, I, I I Tell us the next slide. We will oh, take okay. your slide. Yes, yes. So you will play my slide. Oh, thank you. So uh, it's my honor today to share with you of one of my uh, research uh, uh, interests, uh, which is actively being researched by my group, is on using uh, microwave in hydrothermal carbonizations. And today I will share a little bit of our research on trying to use this process to produce uh, value-added hydrochar and also a vinegar-like oil product uh, using this process. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So as you can see from this slide, uh, these are the biomass and also the waste resources that uh, my research teams have been working on. So we've been actively working on trying to use uh, thermochemical process to convert uh, all these type of different waste and biomass into value-added products. So in particular for today, I will focus on using I mean, uh, to share a little bit on uh, using microwave hydrothermal carbonization to convert one of the most abundant ways uh, in, in Malaysia, which is the uh, empty fruit punch. Can I have next slide, please? Mm. Mm. So, uh, yeah, in Malaysia, we do have a lot of uh, palm oil meal. I think we also have uh, this a lot of palm oil meal in other countries like Brazil. So, uh, in fact, uh, we are trying to extract uh, palm oil from all these uh, uh, palm oil, uh, I mean, uh, plants. So, uh, but in the process of producing the, this palm oil, we also actually actually generate a lot of this uh, oil palm waste. So, in particular, it consists of uh, empty fruit branch, palm mesocarp fiber, and palm shells. So uh, we, these are the ways that we are hoping to convert it into useful products. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So in particular for empty fruit bunch, it's the most abundant waste among the palm oil waste. So as you can see, like we have about 7.3 million tons generated yearly. And they, they do have some these undesired properties if you want to reuse or you want to dispose them straight away. Like they have this high ash content, low heating value, and uh, in particular, it's, it's high moisture content that makes some existing disposal methods unfavorable and because of the low density as well. So that's why we are trying to develop an alternative techniques that can recover this, uh, product, uh, this waste efficiently. Next slide, please. So uh, 
when we talk about using thermochemical technologies, there are a range of the different technologies that we can use. So you can do drying. So basically, it's just to reduce the moisture, and then you want to use it for some purposes. Or you can do hydrothermal treatments. But in this case, the focus will be all more on producing char material and also oil products. Hello. Or you can. Hello. Uh, or you can use thermal technology. That uh, in that case, uh, the aim is more to convert it into fuel pellets, or you can use pyrolysis if you want to convert it into a liquid fuel. So and uh, the the temperature will be five hundred to seven hundred Celsius. Or you can choose to use gasification if you are aiming to produce liquid and also biogas from uh, this process. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. But uh, for today, for today, and what I'm I'm hoping to promote is to use microwave heating in uh, converting this waste. So to make it short, uh, microwave heating it has uh, some uh, advantages. In particular, it would be the indirect and also the volumetric uh, heatings, and. Uh, if you look at the the, uh, the pictures on the left, you can see microwave actually uh, promotes a, a slightly different uh, heating mechanisms compared to conventional heatings. Where microwave heatings, when you expose the microwave to the material, it will generate and heat from the internal of the uh, of the material rather than from outside. So because of these heating mechanisms, the heat it can provide a fast heatings. And normally we will, we will perform microwave at a frequency of 2.45 gigahertz, and uh, the frequency is normally it's up to you. I mean, but normally we will do it at 2.45 gigahertz. Next slide, please. Mm. And for hydrothermal carbonizations, to make it short, is we are trying to use uh, I mean a uh, high pressure, 10 to 40 bar, and also we heat it, uh, and also we uh, we process the waste at a temperature ranging from 180 to 350 Celsius. So we think that it is quite uh, suitable to use it to, I mean, uh, to process uh, waste and biomass with high moisture content. So, so far, I mean, uh, yeah, these are the, the, the different types of waste or biomass that can be used at the feed stocks. So uh, if in particular, if you would like to produce a good quality char material, we call it hydrochar, you can use this process. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are developing a, a microwave uh, processing reactor. We call it as a single mode microwave hydrothermal carbonization reactors. So where we use this to, uh, to process the empty food bunch waste or biomass waste. So we heat it at a range of different temperatures. This is just to see which are the range, the suitable range of temperature to process the waste and also with a heating rate, and followed by, I mean, uh, we are, after that, you have to use a uh, steam to purge it for 10 minutes. In, in the end, you will produce hydrochar as the main product, and also you will collect the EFB vinegar as the liquid uh, uh, products. Next slide, please. So uh, the advantages would be like, uh, if you use a single mode microwave cavity or single mode microwave reactors, what is interesting is you can concentrate or focus the microwave uh, radiations to the uh, to the biomass. So in that case, the heating is quite efficient. And because of uh, of the unique heating mechanism of microwave, so you don't actually need to pre-dry the sample because what we are trying to say here is we are trying to use the moisture content in the uh, in the waste or the biomass that can be a good microwave absorbance, meaning when you expose the microwave heating, the microwave radiation to the waste, because of the moisture content, they can absorb the microwave radiation efficiently, and then it will change, uh, change into heat and also to, to, uh, to thermally process the waste. And we also use steams because we think that the steam has the advantage of uh, improving the breaking down of the waste into uh, smaller compounds that is useful and also we want it to, uh, we think it can promote the hydrolysis reactions. So in the end, because of these hydrothermal uh, reactions and the reaction mechanisms occurring, we can produce hydrochar and also the vinegar. Next slide, please. And uh, these are some of the results that we have obtained so far. If you look at the pictures on the right, you will see this is the char material that we obtained. We found that it's quite rich with carbon content. 
and it's hydrophobic and with uh, I would say with a high uh, and good calorific value that is suitable to use as a solid fuel. And we also produce a, a, a liquid oil products. Uh, it's, it's like vinegar and uh, it's acidic. Uh, so this is what we can get. And then we have run a series of analysis to check the properties of these two main products. Next slide, please. So if you look at the surface morphology, so these are the, the char that we obtain at different range of temperatures. So to make it short, if you process it at the uh, 250, 350 Celsius, you will see pores starting to develop uh, on the char. And this is the hydrochar that we, uh, we find useful so far. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, with respect to the characteristics, you will see uh, we uh, the hydrochar were, detect were detected to have uh, a good amount of fixed carbon, carbon content with a high heating value, about 20.6 uh, megajoules per kg, which is suitable to be used as a solid fuel. And another good thing is it, it's relatively, it has a relatively low oxygen content and also OC and HC ratios. Next slide, please. And with respect to the vinegar, this is the vinegar that we obtain. You see a little bit red color and a bit yellowish colors. And uh, it's, we found that it has quite a rich content of this organic acid and also the phenolic compounds, which uh, tend to have generally good antimicrobial activities and antioxidant activities. So this, this can be used in some other applications as well. So it has a high content of all these compounds, acids, phenols, and we also study like uh, in what, at what temperature, whether it's higher or lower temperatures, you can promote the formation of phenols and also to ensure the balance of a good numbers of, uh, of uh, compounds so that it's, uh, it's, it, it contains the I mean, uh, desirable properties. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is the conclusions that we have so far. We are still working on this. So we found that if we uh, incorporate microwave technologies or microwave heating in this process, it, it provides a good heating rate, okay? It allows a fast heating rate of 150 Celsius. And the char that we obtain, hydrochar, has a low ash content. But generally, what we want to highlight would be the high heating value, which is suitable to be used as a fuel. And the liquid uh, products that we will obtain consists of this acid, phenols, ketone, compound, uh, compound, which can be used in agriculture applications, such as using as an antifungal, tumicidal, and also repellent applications. Yeah, I think that's all I would like to share for today. Thank you very much, and feel free to reach me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Man, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, so we can take a couple of questions, if any question is there. Uh, uh, or Dr. Lam, please stay. Uh, we will take the questions at the end. First, let me have the presentation from uh, all the panelists. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Lam. The next panelist, next panelist is uh, Professor Bhaskar Gurunathan. Uh, I think Bhaskar Gurunathan, are you online? No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let uh, we have uh, uh, next presentation from uh, Professor Young Park. Professor Young Park received his uh, BS, MS, and PhD from the Chemical Engineering of Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in 1992, 1994, and 1999. Professor Park has worked at the Industrial Technology Institute of Hyundai Heavy Industry as a senior researcher. Since 2002, Professor Park has been employed as a professor in the School of Environmental Engineering of the University of Seoul, Korea. <coughs> its current research interests include the production of valuable materials or renewable fuel via catalytic pyrolysis, gasification of biomass and organic waste, Professor Park has published more than 500 journal articles. Professor Park, I welcome you and uh, you can start with your presentation. Professor Park, please. Thank you for your uh, introduction and I'm happy to uh, invite you uh, for this conference. And 
uh, yeah, could you? Uh, uh, yeah, this is not a uh, first page. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, and today I would like to talk about uh, my uh, research research topic, production of bioaromatics via the catalytic pyrosis of biomass on the methane environment. Especially, you know, the normal um, pyrosis are proceeded using meth nitrogen, but in this case, I applied methane for the catalytic pyrosis. Next, next, please. And as you know very well, BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes are important uh, materials for the uh, uh, petrochemical industry. These BTEX are light aromatic hydrocarbons, which are applied to fuel, medicine, plastic, paints, and so on. So the application is uh, very large for the BTEX chemicals. Until now, this BTX can be produced uh, using naphtha reforming process of uh, petroleum. So, as you know, uh, this uh, fossil fuel can be replaced by the renewable sources such as biomass. So we can produce bio BTEX uh, from catalytic phase powers of biomass. This produced uh, bio BTEX can be used, can be replaced to the petroleum-based BTEX. Next, next, please. So uh, uh, this is precisely shows the uh, concept of our studies. As you know, for the upgrading of the uh, bio yield, normally HDO or uh, hydrogen oxygen process uh, can be applied. But this HDO process needs the large amount of the expensive hydrogen. So the economic, economic feasibility will be low if we apply, if we use the large amount of hydrogen. So if we seek the alternative of hydrogen, so which me, this means that we, if we seek the materials which have a large amount of hydrogen, such as methane, we can replace this expensive hydrogen with the cheap Mm, mm, uh, natural gases. Mm. You know, as you know, methane is comprised of one carbon and four hydrogen. So if we apply, if we use methane in the uh, catalytic pyrosis, this methane can be acted as the source of hydrogen. So therefore, we can mm, we, we don't need to use the hydrogen anymore. Next. Next. Yeah. Next. Mm. So uh, from this concept, I applied methane in the cattle paris, uh, especially uh, paris of the uh, rice husk. So we applied different kind of catalyst, commercial zeolite, such as HSM5, HY, HBERA, and different uh, silicon ratio uh, catalyst. Also, gallium was loaded on the uh, HSM5. So for the uh, decomposed of the uh, methane, we applied the nickel-based catalyst. Nickel, ceria, lantern, value-based uh, catalyst was applied for the uh, decomposition of the methane. Next. So, this slide shows the concept of the, uh, uh, our reaction. And you can see the three consecutive reactors, such as R1, R2, and R3. In R1 reactor, methane decomposition catalyst can be loaded or empty lead can be used. If we apply methane decomposition process, methane decomposition catalyst, nickel based catalysts are well, loaded on the R1, R1 reactor. And R2 reactor is the uh, reactor for the pyrus of, pyrus of biomass. So uh, biomass can be uploaded on in this R2 reactor. In R3 reactor, catalytic upgrading can be proceeded. In this R3 reactor, geolized catalysts are loaded. So we uh, applied three consecutive reactors for the uh, uh, conversion of 
rice husk under methane environment. So in methane environment, there are two kinds of the methane environment can apply, applied. Methane without reaction, decomposition and methane with decomposition. So uh, in this table, you can see the uh, product distribution can be different uh, for the different kind of the uh, 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 environment. So for the nitrogen environment, uh, around the, uh, 38, with the bio can be obtained, but for the methane environment, the uh, uh, bio yield is somewhat lower. But meanwhile, methane decomes case, the yield of the bio oil can be enhanced. Especially the amount of coke was lost for the methane decomposed cases. So CH14 means the methane decomposed cases. So we vary the, the methane decomposed temperature to modify the uh, 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 methane decomposed cases. As you can see, methane decomposed cases, the amount of hydrogen is highest. Methane, you know, the methane is comprised of one carbon and four hydrogen. If we decompose methane, we can obtain two hydrogen molecules and carbon solid. So the uh, methane decomposed environment is, is a uh, supply, can supply the hydrogen and some relaxed methane. So this hydrogen relaxed methane can be erected with uh, uh, biomass pyrosis products. Next, please. So you can see the uh, result of the uh, BTX yield. As you can see that nitrogen environment produced the lowest amount of the BTX. But if we add methane, the yield of aromatics uh, were increased. But if we, apply, if we apply a methane decomposed cases, the yield of aromatics increased greatly. Especially if we uh, change the temperature of the methane decomposition, the temperature of 650 degrees Celsius produced the largest amount of hydrogen. As you can see right side picture, the uh, combustion of hydrogen was the highest. So the yield of the aromatics can be related with the amount of the uh, hydrogen to methane ratio. Next, please. And this slide shows the effect of the different kind of zeolite. If we apply HY, HBERA, and HGCN5 with a similar silicon ratio, the HGCN5 produces the largest amount of the BTX. This is maybe due to the uh, uh, shape selectivity of the HGCN5 and their uh, high uh, strong acidity. And if we change the silicon aluminum ratio, silicon aluminum ratio change, change means the uh, acid change. So low silicon aluminum ratio means the high acidity. So high, in high acidity, Okay. the yield of aromatics was the highest. But if we decrease, increase the silicon ratio, the yield of the aromatics also decreased. So the acidity and structure of zeolite is very important for the uh, production of the aromatics. Next, please. And if we unload the uh, metal, like gallium, on GSM5, the acidity may be changed. As you can see in the table, uh, if you load up the one weight percent gallium, the total acidity may be similar, but somewhat uh, weak acid site uh, increase. But if you increase the more gallium, two or three, the total acidity decreases significantly. So this is the uh, optimal content of the gallium may be uh, present on the uh, applied catalyst. Next, next please. So uh, uh, in this uh, figure, you can see that the uh, highest amount of BTX can be obtained for one weight percent of gallium mm, catalyst. This means the optimal ratio of gallium and GSM5 is, is uh, uh, needed for the production of a high amount of aromatics. Next, please. So is, in summarizing our result, so the uh, mm, most uh, GCN5 is the most effective geology framework for the products of BTEX. And the use of gas methane decomposition is the uh, highly desirable reaction environment for the production of high yield of BTEX. And especially one weight percent gallium GCN5, which has the optimal uh, balancing of the metal and, and um, pure acidity, is the, uh, can be regarded as the best catalyst for the production of BTEX aromatics. Thank you.
uh, for your uh, listening. Hmm. Is maximum amount of VTEX can be obtained from the biomass. Thank you. So the next speaker, our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Bhaskar Gurunathan. Professor Bhaskar Gurunathan is uh, currently working at St. Joseph College of Engineering, Chennai. Dr. Bhaskar has published more than 160 research and uh, review articles in national and international journals of uh, repute. He has uh, edited uh, a number of books and written a number of chapters and uh, different books published by different international publishers. His current area of research include food toxicology, biofuels and bioenergy, nanocatalysis, therapeutic proteins, microbial enzymes, bioremediation, etc. He has organized a number of conferences and uh, he has uh, been involved or he has been, got funding for a number of projects from different national and international funding agencies. Dr. Bhaskar, I welcome you uh, to this uh, sixth C conference. So now you can have your presentation. Dr. Bhaskar, please. Yes, 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 thank you, sir. I hope it is audible. Uh, uh, sorry for uh, late joining. So, so I got some uh, technical issues. Uh, so hope uh, now it is audible. Please, uh, um, anyone, please confirm. Is it audible to everyone? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry, sir. So, uh, once again, I apologize for uh, late delay, late joining. So, I had some technical issues. Okay. So, uh, let me have the uh, slides in full view. Excuse me. Slide is not in full view for me. So, this is in full, full view from our side. Maybe here some oh, Sorry, now it's so it is showing in layout form with all our images, photos. I think you know uh, your I... slide. Yes, yes. Uh, shall I share my slide? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, just one minute. Yes, yes, yes um, please. Sir, just click, click on the screen. You will be able to view the wider things. In, in, in this. So, is it visible to you all my power screen? Are you sharing? Hello, sir. sir? Ah, yes, Hello, yes, sir. sir. You are speaking. Yeah. This is perfect. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, you are speaking in Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, hope. Uh, go to PowerPoint. Like, you, you are not, you will okay, not okay, see thanks. the floor. Oh, yeah. so, so now, sir, now, are you able to see the PowerPoint now? Yes, we are able to see. Everybody can see this now. You please go ahead with your presentation. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, 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 please, yes, please. So, thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, so my uh, topic is uh, techno-economic analysis of biodiesel production from uh, colobulum inobulum oil. So this colobulum inobulum um, oil is the non-edible oil. So this is utilized for the production of biodiesel uh, using an anacatalyst. So just we have a uh, uh, few uh, slides uh, introduction. So fossil fuel is the, uh, as we know, it's the uh, most uh, um, consuming uh, energy source in the uh, world uh, for various uh, activities, industrial applications, and transport. Okay, so fossil fuel leads to major uh, environmental pollution, greenhouse uh, uh, emission, and global warming, climate change. So, and there is a, a dramatic increase in the demand for the fossil fuels also. So, uh, people have started uh, researchers have started uh, identifying in the alternate sources uh, to overcome the issues uh, to the fossil fuel so due to the increase in the demand okay. 
So the as a biofuel offers many advantages compared to the fossil fuels, including availability, so biodegradability, sustainability, and uh, uh, less uh, environmental uh, effect. So among this uh, biofuel, so we go biodiesel, bioethanol, biogas. So among this, so uh, uh, biodiesel is one of the um, uh, most prominent uh, on the biofuel or in compared to the bioethanol or biogas. So this can be um, produced in uh, through a one um, uh, step technology when compared to the bioethanol and this can be easily stored and transported okay, like uh, other uh, liquid fuels. The biodiesel would work in the diesel engine without any so, modifications. So for biodiesel production, we use uh, earlier uh, edible oils, so known as uh, first generation feedstock. So that uh, the use of first generation feedstock uh, created an issue with the food versus fuel. So therefore, researchers uh, started focusing on the second generation feedstock, which are uh, uh, considered as cost effective and economically feasible and not competitive with the uh, food products. So the so non-edible oils are considered as the second generation biofuel. So this uh, colobulum inobulum is uh, one of the uh, most uh, um, promising so non-edible oil uh, for the production of biodiesel. So that's why we focused on this colobulum inobulum. So the um, in India particularly uh, we have the um, increased production of, uh, potentials for castor oil, colobulum inobulum oils. So these uh, non-edible uh, oils uh, the plants which produces the non edible oil which can be cultivated not only in the agriculture land even in the uh, rail uh, land okay, which are not fit for the agriculture so can be converted into the federal land uh, for production of this for cultivation of this plant so particularly colobulum inobulum uh, this uh, life is uh, about the 50 to 60 years and we started giving uh, yielding the seeds after three years okay and uh, this will give uh, yield a throughout the year okay so the annual yield of uh, the three year old tree is 22 to 100 kg of seeds so and this will serve for uh, 50 to 60 years so among these various non-edible uh, uh, seeds considered for biodiesel production the coloplum inoculum uh, contains 60 to 70 percent oil content and in india we have a lot of potentials for the production of this coloplum inoculum so that's why we selected this so the technical analysis is the one of the uh, important uh, uh, on the step which is involved in technology development for uh, commercialization before industrialization or commercialization okay so this helps you as to uh, simulate the uh, system uh, the entire process in this respect process in the uh, system and we can uh, simulate and we can understand the various uh, issues involved and we can analyze the various possibilities of uh, and then uh, before uh, uh, commercializing the technology okay. so in this study we have used a super pro software okay and uh, we used our uh, laboratory data to simulate the uh, uh, industrial scale process in the super uh, super pro software and we have analyzed the uh, capital investment overall production cost and the revenue of wider production so this is the overall uh, uh, process uh, which we used in our study. So we extracted the colobulum inoculum oil from the seeds, okay. And uh, this oil is uh, uh, reacted with methanol in the presence of nanocatalyst. We synthesis the nanocatalyst from uh, waste plast of Paris. So through transformation, biodiesel was produced. So that, and then uh, the nanocatalyst was uh, recovered and reused, okay. Then the um, crude biodiesel is separated from glycerol and methanol. Uh, crude biodiesel was washed and then it is uh, quantified and uh, uh, analyzed uh, for its various physical chemical and uh, uh, properties. Okay. So methanol was uh, recovered and reused in the process and glycerol is, is as a, considered as a byproduct. So we initially we optimized the various uh, process parameters for the production of biodiesel from this colobulum inoculum. So we optimized the calcination temperature of the catalyst, uh, catalyst concentration and oil to methanol ratio uh, so at 800 catalyst prepared at 800 degree of uh, the um, calcination temperature and uh, catalyst concentration of 6% uh, weight per weight of the oil and uh, the methanol to oil ratio of 
9 is to 1 uh, as given a higher uh, biodiesel yield. So and we optimize the uh, the uh, transferization time and uh, we found a maximum of biodiesel uh, at 18 minutes okay. and we reuse the catalyst for uh, several cycles and uh, we found there was no much significant difference uh, decrease uh, up to four cycles so at the end of the four cycle we are able to get a 76 percent of yield when compared to the cycle one so after a uh, fourth cycle, the uh, decrease in the uh, biodiesel yield was uh, significant. Therefore, uh, we recommended uh, that uh, this catalyst can be used for four cycles. So based on this laboratory data, we have simulated, uh, we have characterized the uh, producer biodiesel using FTIR to confirm the presence of uh, ester uh, functional group in the biodiesel. The presence of ester is confirmed with a uh, peak at uh, 1023. Uh, centimeter inverse and uh, the biodiesel was characterized using uh, the GCMS and the presence of uh, cis linoleic acid methyl ester and 9 octodecanoic acid methyl ester and methyl denitroxy octodecanate was confirmed uh, with the retention time of 36.4 minute, 34.9 minute and 33.7 minutes respectively. So this confirms uh, the, the presence of the uh, methyl esters in the biodiesel, then this methyl ester is considered uh, the biodiesel. So these are the physiochemical properties of the biodiesel, uh, uh, our biodiesel, and it is compared with the ASTM standard and IS standard. Acid value, um, density, uh, kinematic viscosity, uh, copper to corrosion uh, test, uh, flash point, power point, cloud point, Four point moisture content and color value of the biodiesel were tested, and uh, here you can see the our results are uh, matching are within the range uh, provided by ASTM standard and IS uh, standard. So we simulated a uh, uh, industrial scale, large scale uh, process in the uh, SuperPro software with uh, twelve thousand kg per uh, batch of uh, the uh, seed and uh, this process was uh, uh, analyzed for various uh, economic uh, perspectives okay. so here uh, we consider uh, the cost of the various input materials uh, uh, and the current market value colorful enol oil are considered 0.4 uh, dollar per unit catalyst 1.34 dollar per unit and here we uh, use uh, 23,000 um, sorry 23 million um, kgs of uh, color bloom oil and uh, with other uh, input sources okay. and the cost of the annual cost of the various products were uh, various uh, feed uh, inputs were calculated we are based on the unit cost and the uh, annual amount okay. and uh, from this you can see the uh, major contribution in the uh, input material cost of input materials is on the uh, color bloom in oil because the uh, we use the nano catalyst which can be reused for several cycles therefore the cost is decreased and the methanol also reused the so through our uh, through our technomanic analysis we have the summaries here total capital investment uh, is about uh, uh, two million dollars and the total revenues is about uh, 18 million dollars so therefore the return on investment uh, will be 92.96 uh, percent with a payback uh, period of 1.08 years and uh, internal uh, rate on return uh, with 70.31% uh, and net present value at a 7% interest rate of $16 million. So in conclusion, uh, through this uh, process, we are able to get the 91.95% uh, 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 of uh, biodiesel um, uh, conversion. Okay. Uh, from the color bloom oil at optimal conditions so other than this one factor optimization we have optimized this process using response surface methodology and uh, using uh, green chemistry balance also so those results are not included here the color bloom oil price is lower when compared to other uh, non-edible oil and the conversion rate is, uh, is also high so therefore uh, we are able to produce a uh, biodiesel with less cost when compared to the other non-edible oil the annual biodiesel revenue was $15 million per year. The backpack period is 1.08 uh, uh, 
uh, yes so the installation of large scale biodiesel facility are you seen this color blue mile could have a positive impact and will generate new jobs for the uh, poorest communities particularly farmers okay so if they uh, cultivate these uh, plants they will get uh, a more uh, high income so, so therefore biodiesel may be good energy alternate opportunity in the future using this uh, color blue mile so these are some of the uh, publications related to this uh, study so if you are interested you can uh, anyone interested you can um, refer these uh, publications so thank you for the organizers for the opportunities uh, provided and the uh, moderators and the conveners of this conference so thank you sir thank you uh, dr bhaskar this uh, was a wonderful presentation because technical yeah, aspect yes sir thank you and techno commercial evaluation is very important to know the feasibility of any given uh, technique and uh, this was interesting to see that the payback period is just one year no doubt uh, that by this the number of new jobs can be generated this can be a great possible fuel and uh, overall it can play a role in the development of the nation so thank you dr bhaskar for this wonderful presentation on uh, techno commercial or techno economical aspects of this uh, bio thank you professor thank you professor pilot please uh, stay here till we have the panel discussion so next speaker of this session is uh, dr s sarvana murugan dr sarvana murugan is uh, physically present here so he will be giving his uh, presentation Dr. Sarvana Murugan, presently working as Scientist E at the Center of Innovation and Applied Bioprocessing, Mohali, India, since uh, last five years. He obtained his PhD in the field of heterogeneous catalysis from Anna University, and uh, he has worked on different positions in different universities uh, like uh, Inha University, South Korea. Technical University, Denmark. Uh, uh, he has been to Germany on DST that fellowship, and uh, he has also been awarded earlier early career research award by the DST India. He has published about uh, 75 peer-reviewed publications, and uh, he has either filed or granted <coughs> nine patents to his. Uh, uh, credit. So I welcome you, uh, Dr. Sarvana Murugan, for this presentation. Please present and keep uh, time limit in your mind while presenting. Thank you, Dr. Sarvana Murugan. Thank you, Professor Dhar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, today I am going to talk about the production of sustainable chemicals with the heterogeneous catalysis. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially Professor Pandey, for giving this opportunity to share my work with you all. So, I'm going to give a brief introduction about the biomass and a little bit about the catalyst which we were used, and then there will be some conclusion. So, we all know that this second generation biomass. Yeah, we all know that this second generation biomass is quite important and it is going to be an alternative and also an indispensable carbon source for producing chemicals and fuels because it is not related to the food and also it is not linked with the food chain. So this slide gives you an overview of what we have been doing for the last 13 years related to the biomass transformation. So basically what we do is we develop a catalyst to produce a carbon chemical selectively. So I'm going to take few examples from this and then we'll be discussing with you for the next few minutes. So before that you can see this just, okay, it's not visible. This, of the chemical process, more than 80% is related to the heterogeneous catalysis. The rest is belongs to the homogeneous and the biocatalytic process. So zeolite is one of the interesting heterogeneous catalysts, which you can see this graph shows the letters are not clear. The more than 50% of zeolite is used as a catalyst, especially in the petrochemical industry. 
So, already Professor Park talked about the zeolite in the last presentation. So, I just would like to add a bit more to that. The zeolite is a microporous crystalline material where you can play with the acid sites. That are the very important for the catalysis. For example, you can see this proton bale is a strong branch acid sites, which can be changed by substituting aluminum with the tin. You can change the acidic property from transfer to Lewis acid sites. And also, it has a wide range of uh, advantages. So the first example I'm going to discuss about is the production of methyl lactate from various sugars. So let's take the first example. This is the C3 sugar, that's a glycerolidivide, uh, or you can say dihydroxyacetone. I will take these two examples with this zeolite. This is called Y zeolite. One with the lower silicon to aluminum ratio, and the other one is higher. You can see the one is giving near quantitative yield of methyl lactate compared to the, the other one. So we were wondering why this difference. Then we tried to do a, some unique characterization technique to find out the active sites. So what we understood is this HUS56 has more number of Lewis acid sites than the other one. So what it tells, so we found that this is a kind of a probe reaction. If you have a Lewis acid sites, you will lead to the formation of methyl lactate. So we wanted to have a solid evidence so what we did, as I said before, we get rid of this branched acid sites by substituting a tetravalent thing, so where we produce a strong Lewis acid catalyst. So then you see what zeolite does. This zeolite does a lot of wonders. You can see this tin beta, for example, this tin. Yeah, the tin beta zeolite, you can see, it gives almost 100% yield. One can ask that the whether tin is in the framework of the zeolite or not. So we put tin oxide on beta and it didn't give anything. So it means that the tin in the framework it acts as an active size. So then what we did is we extended this study to the other sugar because C3 sugar is not uh, cheaper. So you can see we used this uh, we used this as glucose and sucrose also. We were we obtained around 64% of methyl lactate. So along with the tin zeolite, we also used zirconium and titanium, but the tin beta shows a much higher yield. So there is another interesting technique to why one zeolite uh, active, activity of the one zeolite is more than the other. This is another interesting characterization technique. One can identify the, the, the strength of the Lewis acid size. For example, if you use cyclohexanone as a probe molecule, you see a large shift towards the lower prime number, then your catalyst has a stronger Lewis acid size than the other. So the another another zeolite actually in case of tin beta we need to substitute the metal. Then we were exploring why don't we try with the normal zeolite. We have developed a new process to enhance uh, the fructose yield via two-step process. So the first, I will take one example with the oil zeolite. After the first step, we obtained only 22% of fructose. Then we obtained this methylated fructose as high yield. And then the, during the second step, we add water, and you can see that the yield of fructose increased from 20 to 55. This is a two-step process. Of course, now the recent literature shown that the more than 50% can be obtained. So then we expanded this study to other sugars, C5, it's also a part of the biomass. You can see this xylose to xylulose through the same reaction pathway, we are able to get around 50%. The 15 of 50% is not the small amount, it's a very significant amount of the isomerization of sugars. Also you can see that the C4 sugar enclose, which is not naturally available much compared to the C6 and C5 sugars, but it has a lot of applications. And then this catalyst still work for the C4 sugar as well. So then you can see that we, sorry, we are using the similar type of zeolite just by a simple modification. So the previous work I see that we convert from glucose to fructose. When we change the as active sites of the the material, then you can see the product goes to from fructose to HMF ether, which is we are getting around 50%. And similarly, if you see, here, no, the previous, the next one, yes. 
So the this is next one. Yes. Yeah, this one actually the same zeolite. If you can optimize the conditions, you can control the formation of femtos. And if you change then the conditions or the activity of the material, then you can go to the HMF for these puranic compounds. Then you can also make this alkyl lubricate. So in this case, we have changed the experimental conditions to obtain this alkyl lubricate directly from the sugars. Next, next please. Okay, fine. So this is one more interesting uh, application for the zeolite. The zeolite is known for the shape selective catalysis. So you can see that the C2 sugar, this is the least possible sugar, which can be converted into the C4 sugars. So I can, okay, slides are off due to some technical problems. So what I want to say is, the C2 sugar can selectively transform into C4 sugars if you use the right zeolite. So we have used two types of zeolite, one is the medium pore, the other one is large pore. So when we use the medium pore zeolite, which has a typical pore size of around 5.5 Armstrong, it can accommodate the small, small sugars, that is the C4 sugars. But in case of large pore zeolite, what happens, it can accommodate the bigger sugar molecules. So once the C4 sugar forms, it can react with another molecule of C2 and it converts into the C6 sugars. So that was, uh, it was in that slide. So choosing the right zeolite is very important so that you can enhance the selectivity of the target product. So here you can see, So the next, we also we are also working on the metal oxide system. I'll briefly go through it. This is the selective hydrogenation of aldehyde to alcohol. So this slide, I'm not going to uh, discuss with you in detail, but I want to say that when you change the phase of a particular metal oxide system, you can change the product selectivity. For example, if you see this monochalic zirconium oxide, it gives a new quantitative yield of mercurial alcohol, but in case of tetrapanol zirconia, it gives much lower yield. So, we do a lot of supporting experiments to understand how the active sites are generated. So, we understood that the minus 1 1 plane of monochalic zirconium oxide possesses a lot of basic sites which catalyze the reaction efficiently. Next slide, please. So the next is, is it is related to the selective oxidation of HMF. Please move. So here we develop a catalyst based on uh, manganese oxide where we use various precipitant to precipitate. Then we found the when urea was used as a precipitant, we can get almost close to 100% selectivity of the DFF. So once we incorporate iron into the manganese oxide, the reaction push forward from DFF to F of CA. So though the yield is low here, around only 37%, but we have recently developed the catalyst, which goes above 50%. Next slide, please. So the next is the hydro deoxygenation of uh, uh, the, the sugar-based molecules. That is, one is the methyl lactate to propionic acid. So here, this oxygen will be selectively removed to produce the corresponding ester. Next slide. So, here you can see we developed a catalyst based on the zirconium oxide, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So the monoclinic phase somehow it retains its activity, but only, mono, only zirconium oxide is not enough to do the deoxygenation. So we have chosen the combination of iron and nickel. When we do that, this is an interesting technique it will tell us about the active species. So it completely shift the reaction, shift the reduction temperature towards the lower temperature. That means the combination of iron and nickel generates a lot of active species which can selectively remove the hydroxyl group of methyl lactate and produce corresponding propionic acid is around 73%. So this uh, conclusion, what we have developed a catalyst based on the zeolite and also the metal oxide system which can selectively transform a biomass based substrate to target chemicals in high selectivity. So, I have to thank a lot of people, so I am not going to read it out. So, 
the authors who have contributed to all these papers, I am gratefully acknowledging, and also funding agency, my institute, and especially my students who contribute to this work as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Charmana Lulupan, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I think this presentation is continuation of that uh, that was by Dr. Uh, Park on uh, catalytic pyrolysis. So Dr. Uh, Sarvana Murugan has presented that uh, the role of geolites uh, in heterogeneous catalysis, as well as uh, he has emphasized that we should select the these catalysts very carefully to have the maximum output. So thank you, Dr. Sarvana Murugan, for this uh, wonderful presentation. So the next speaker of the day for this session is uh, Dr. Richa Kothari. Dr. Richa Kothari presently working in the Department of Environmental Sciences in the Central University of Jammu. Jammu. She is having more than 15 years of teaching and uh, research experience. She is actively involved in the area of algal based biofuel production, biohydrogen production and utilization of renewable energy for wastewater treatment. She is recipient of a number of prestigious research fellowships uh, uh, like from Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, from Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, etc. She has published about 100 research papers in uh, different journals of repute and she is associated in the editorial activities also of some of the journals and she has presented her work all over the globe in different international conferences in different countries like Malaysia, South Africa, United States and of course India. So Dr. Kothari, I welcome you to this session on uh, thermochemical processes for biomasses and uh, please start your presentation. Dr. Richa Kothari. Thank you, sir. And I also thank to all the organizers to give me this opportunity to share my views on hydrothermal liquefaction of algal biomass for bio crude oil and value added products. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, we are all aware that uh, there are the main issues we have to manage population, urbanization, industrialization, fossil fuels, and environmental health and hygiene. Because these all the five issues are interrelated and uh, harming our environmental health and hygiene directly or indirectly. So what should be the potential solutions we should focus on or need of, need of an art to proceed on that part? Next slide, please. So as per my knowledge, these the potential solution we should focus on for policy implementation and awareness although it should be awareness is the one of the thought in which we can human population can contribute policy part somehow relate with the governmental agencies then rest for sustainable development sustainable green alternatives renewable resources green sustainable technologies all the four potential solutions i have mentioned here somehow deal with the social environment and economical aspects if we combine all these so one point should be common that is a sustainable whatever the thing or whatever the technologies we have to find or we have to choose it should be sustainable on the part of social part environment part and economical part. so on that part uh, we have to proceed on next uh, slide please so on that part, biofuel policy has been uh, came in 2018 with the some major highlights that how we have to infrastructural investments in uh, rural areas, what are the health benefits we should focus on, how we have to manage the MSW management, means the solid waste management, how we have to reduce import dependency on fossil fuels part, additional income to farmers, which are the major key holders in our agricultural sector of India. What are the different employment generations? Uh, back, please. 
and what are the cleaner environment we should focus on and how should we have to get, get that sustainable technologies on that part next please so on that part bioenergy is one of the best alternative energy option although other options we have solar wind hydro but bioenergy is the environmental friendly and renewable which is uh, considered as a promising substitution for addressing the energy crisis and environmental issues or the issues i have discussed in the first slide for addressing the energy crisis and environmental on the part of fossil fuel use so biofuel and petroleum liquid fuels as we are uh, discussing that uh, ma biofuels mainly in the form of biodiesel bioethanol biogas and biohydrogen and so we are getting attention day by day on this part next slide please why we have to focus on algal biomass as a feed stock of bioenergy it is a third generation biofuel 3g we are uh, nominating it as and mostly production of algal bi drive by liquid fuels involves catalytic transification conversion processes are typically performed by the bio and thermochemical methods it has the potential to convert it is with the high oil content around 20 to 80 percent of oil by dry weight of biomass high photosynthetic efficiency rapid growth rate and no requirement of variable and uh, fertile which could be excellent biofuel energy crop so and in the last d oil or residual algal biorefinery also contribute to the generation of potential valuable products nutraceuticals pharmaceuticals pigments are there along with the soil conditioning products when it can be utilized for the as a part of fertilizers next slide please if we go for the uh, this slide there is a first part belongs to the fossil fuel based biomass and uh, algal biomass is the connecting link between the conventional and the uh, future uh, road map what we are planning to do with the algal biomass so because algal cells can fix uh, co2 in the atmosphere and we are getting it from the uh, fossil fuel burning also so it is a one of the interlink in between how we can correlate those things which we are disturbing our environment next slide please and in this slide i want to show that it is a single algal cell on the uh, right hand side which have the potential to explore or which have the potential to uh, meet the our energy demands just it is a single cell algal biomass which is enriched with carbohydrates lipids proteins in uh, their cell next slide please algal biomass and its composition mainly as i said that biomass of algae contains organic carbon oxygen and nitrogen and inorganic element elements are there in that cell so it is a mainly bio, main biomass which can has a potential we can convert into our bio oil or bio crude oil and the other value added products next slide please if we go for the algal conversion to biofuel is typically performed by the bio and thermochemical methods in which some uh, thermochemical me uh, biological methods are uh, fermentation anaerobic digestion transesterification of lipids fast pyrolysis photobiological hydrogen production biohydrogen production and microbial fuel cells these are the major sources which we can con convert into the as per our need of the energy then the chemical conversion of al algae normally i have said that biodiesel by uh, transesterification is a chemical conversion process next slide please yes this is a thermochemical conversion it is a biomass to biofuel involves all those processes that are thermal decomposition as the main process gasification pyrolysis liquefaction 
these are the normal uh, please stay on this the transformation of wet biomass into liquid fuel is known as thermochemical liquefaction process which is almost similar as gasification process liquefaction uh, in comparison to the next slide please this is the hydrothermal liquefaction what we have talked in our uh, title of bio algal biomass it is a thermochemical conversion of biomass into liquid fuel by processing in a hot high pressurized water environment in which solid biopolymeric structure transform into liquid fuels that hydrothermal liquefaction of algae is characterized by physical and chemical conversions at high temperature normally we have proceed with the two, uh, more than 250 to 380 degree centigrade and the high autothermal pressure of water the, this thermochemical conversion process of biomass has higher energy efficiency in comparison to the process that required drying because normally uh, if you go for the conventional algal biomass for, uh, conversion process for the biodiesel that uh, wet biomass uh, required a high energy for the process to convert uh, for consuming it in distillation and drying for that wet algal biomass but if we go for the hydrothermal liquefaction that wet algal biomass can be directly used utilized for the biofuel production without the need for drying so it is one of the advantage with the hydrothermal liquefaction of algal biomass and which indirectly improves the economics of the process and development of algal biofuel industry also if we go for uh, what are the other advantages with the stl involves is uh, that if we go for hydrothermal liquefaction for liquid component crude bio oil is the final product we can explore if you go for hydrothermal carbonization that solid component biochar is the final product and hydrothermal gasification gas component we can use it for fuel gas next slide please it is a common uh, pathway we have or mechanism with uh, we have involved it in uh, stl pathway so at the high temperature or the at these elevated temperature and pressure the physical properties of water change such that it promotes both the degradation of the macromolecules found in biomass and polymerization of smaller molecules into the larger compounds that make up bio oil next slide please so in this stl uh, mechanism we have get gas phase aqueous phase solid phase and crude bio oil and which is finally can be converted into syngas fuel uh, fuel biochar or fertilizer recyclable water can again utilize for the algal cultivation because it is rich in uh, nutrients and refined bio oil value added products can also be explored with this part next slide please what are the different factors which should be noticed when we go for the stl uh, mechanism of algal biomass one of the important factor is the temperature which plays an important role on bio oil yield from micro algae stl so temperature selection is essential for the safety and economics of its industrial operation the range which should we have to uh, maintain it should be in 250 to 370 degree centigrade as per the literature then uh, second is the reaction time so maximum conversion of organics in algae of algae into bio oil sufficient reaction time is necessary reaction time is a uh, one of the crucial factor because if we go for the uh, time is too short then also the final efficiency of the process affected or uh, oil yield will be negatively affected but if we go for the uh, reaction time is uh, too long then also it uh, impact impact negative impact on the process so uh, 30 to 60 minute has been reported as the maximum time or the time duration for the max maximum oil, bio oil yield 
Next uh, important uh, is the water density or pressure. 5 to 30 million Pascal is the mega Pascal is uh, reported as the optimized pressure condition for uh, the HDL algal biomass. And it is characterized with the autothermal water pressure. Higher water density accelerate the release of more hydrogen ions and so from high temperature and compressed water. Therefore, we should have to focus on this uh, factor also that what we are going to achieve on the part of bio yield. Other important factor is algal species size and its composition. Normally, if we go further in the lab condition or control conditions, we select the algal species with the with their growth in the media conditions. Normally, we have used BBM medium media, then uh, agar BBM media, high media is there, and other is uh, some other media's uh, concentrations are there, which normally used for the feed the algal biomass, but as per our recent research in my lab, we have gone for the algal biomass with the wastewater growth, wastewater as the growth media for the algal species. And we get a good results on the part of that it released with the high amount of protein, lignin content, that uh, lipid content, carbohydrate, protein. So it also affect, impact on the crude oil yield and quality too. Some common species normally utilizing for this HTL biomass are Desmodesmus species, Scandesmus, Chlorella vulgaris, Nanochloropsis, Dunalella, and Spirulina are the some common species which are on the part of uh, in the lab scale normally utilized by the uh, researchers. Other important uh, parameter is catalyst. It is also one of the. Uh, please conclude within a minute, please. Yes, sir, please. So, normally homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts are utilized for this uh, conversion. Next, please. Next. Yeah. So, as. as um, the all the uh, processes what we have discussed or we are uh, focusing on it has challenges and perspectives both are uh, interrelated with that on the part of challenges identification and selection of potential algal strains for effective yield is important techno economical barriers in algal biomass harvesting such as low yield high operation maintenance cost optimization of pro process parameters what we have discussed uh, five to six important parameters in htl of algal biomass conversion process these should be optimized as per the uh, type of algal strain. So HTL produces various oxygenated and chlorinated compounds that cause corrosion reactor. So these are the important uh, challenges with the researches is going on. And we have to improve these challenges. And what are the different perspectives that uh, it is a developmental stage. It needs more focus to improve the bio uh, bio oil yield so more r and d is needed to reduce the challenges with associated next slide so in my view uh, hydrothermal liquefaction is the one of the best alternative among what we have uh, proceeding it is a very promising technology for bio oil production from algal biomass and uh, because it avoid the high energy cost of drying, drying HTL can convert proteins and polysaccharides into an energy dense bio oil. That, that is one of the important uh, observation has been uh, by the researchers. And it also facilitates the separation and recycling of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, calcium, magnesium, and potassium by re recycling the water, we, what we have used in the hydrothermal pressure. So more research and development is needed to reduce the cost of STL. That's from my side. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti, for this uh, wonderful presentation on use of hydrothermal liquefaction for the conversion of algae into oil. oil. That can be a future renewable, uh, you can say, fuel uh, for uh, everyone. Uh, so the next presentation is uh, by Professor Ashok Kumar Viramuthu. Professor Ashok Kumar Viramuthu is presently a research professor and uh, he received his PhD from University of Madras, Chennai in 2014. He has worked in a number of uh, laboratories uh, in different countries. Uh, like he has worked in Indo Australian on Indo Australian Fellowship and uh, worked in Adelaide University Australia and then uh, he has worked in the Department of uh, Chemical Technology where he is presently working rather uh, that is University uh, that is uh, Chulalong uh, oh, very difficult for me to pronounce University Bangkok he has worked as a postdoc scientist in micro LP biorefinery uh, in uh, University Technology Malaysia. For some time, he had worked in uh, National Chen Kung University Taiwan also. He is having about 13 years of uh, experience in the field of energy and environment. He had, is a wonderful combination as he has worked in academics as well as in industry. And his area of expertise mainly include biofuel, biofinery, wastewater treatment using microalgae, particularly then carbon dioxide sequestration and uh, value-added bioproducts. These, these are very important areas at present. And uh, he has published uh, a number of research papers and uh, he is associated with, <coughs> with a number of journals as uh, editor or guest editor or associate editor. So, Professor Ashok Kumar, I welcome you on behalf of the organizers to this uh, conference. Now you can have your presentation. Dr. Ashok Kumar, please. Yes, sir. So, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, perfect, Dr. Sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. Perfect, please go ahead. Yeah, sir. So th thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So in this uh, you know, connections, I would like to thank the organizers, specifically Professor Ashok Pandey, uh, uh, Dr. Sunita, and uh, other organizer and VK uh, go so Professor VK go. So uh, thank you very much sir, for giving me this opportunity. Today my topic is advanced technologies in microalgal research uh, for uh, biofuels and high value added bioproducts. Okay, I think uh, introductions. Everyone is familiar with this uh, introduction slide because what are the major issues right now we are facing based on uh, due to the population growth because we almost reach 7.9 billion populations in the world. And due to the population, the major uh, problem is like wastewater discharge from various sectors like uh, municipal or uh, industrial or agriculture. And the other way is like fossil fuel depletions and followed by industrial flue gas because of inter industrialization. And the output of this is uh, global warming. So how this global warming issues is going to solve, okay, so mitigate with this uh, help of the potential candidate that is microalgae. So microalgae have recently attracted considerable interest worldwide due to their potential applications towards the renewable energy and pharmaceutical like uh, uh, value added products. So uh, microalgae is a promising alternative for uh, CO2 mitigations uh, okay, by uh, uh, CO2 fixation and biofuel production and other uh, process. Okay, next slide please. Uh, this slide shows that uh, different source of renewable energy like uh, uh, hydropower and wind, uh, wind energy and uh, so on so. I think everyone discussed uh, many things about this one. And today we are going to see biomass, bioenergy, and uh, and its products. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows that different generation, like first generation, second generation, third generation, and fourth generation biofuels. Uh, so almost uh, like the first and second generation fuels have certain problems, like food versus fuel debates and other uh, like uh, economical way, so many problems. So that's why the researcher right now we are in third generation biofuel. Uh, specifically from, from uh, uh, microalgal uh, uh, sustainable energy. And also the fourth generation, this is also very important that uh, we are going to modify the genetically, genetical uh, you know, um, characterization or some improving the yield by uh, some different process like integrated process. So, so third and uh, fourth generation biofuel is very important for this scenario. 
let's go ahead next slide please sir microalgae microalgae is a group of uh, microorganism that have an excel, uh, excellent potential in um, you know wide array of uh, application in biomedical uh, bioremediation agents and feedstock for production of fuels bioactive compounds fertilizer and animal feeds the biodiversity of microalgae is enormous and they represent an almost untapped resource it has been estimated that 200000 to 800000 species uh, in many with a different uh, genera, genera exist in the world and in this 50000 species are described it and over 15 uh, 15000 uh, uh, novel compounds originated from algal biomass have been chemically identified for example carotenoids antioxidant fatty acid enzyme polymers uh, peptides so on so so why we uh, we want to go for a microalgae for a Uh, product biodiesel and other uh, products so here the pro, uh, you know the solution that why we are looking for algae is algae grow very fast and algae can have high biofuel yield algae consume co2 because one to grow 1 kg of biomass it require 1.8 kg of carbon dioxide almost double the amount of carbon dioxide required so that's why algae is one of the one of important uh, algal fuel is one of the important carbon neutral fuel okay which uh, easily mitigate the co2 and algae do not compete with the agricultural crops and it also used uh, as a purify water purify it can be grown in uh, waste water like different waste water as we shown in the first line and uh, they also grown in any uh, many uh, like uh, many conditions it also create new job uh, many good things let's move to other slide so in this uh, uh, from lab scale to uh, large scale production so it is very important to scale up process in the scale up process so uh, normally the researcher focus two different methods of cultivation the one is uh, first one is like open raised upon system and so second one is the closed system each system have a different uh, methods of harvest like it depends upon our requirement okay like batch harvest or semi continuous harvest or continuous harvest so how we require, how what, what is our need so we can go for this one next slide please uh this slide shows that large scale cultivation methods like uh, what are the uh, ponds and what are the types of ponds and closed reactor okay coming to the open raised pond Uh, there are different types of uh, ponds i have shown here like rectangular pond circular pond and the low cost made polythene sheet ponds and normally normally the open raised pond is uh, uh, currently the most frequent used and cheapest cultivation system for commercial production of microalgae and raised pond systems are uh, used commercially worldwide including uh, like united states uh, india and um, uh, thailand and many countries china so many countries for the production of you know high value added products uh, for human being human consumptions at large scale uh, reactors from 1000 liter to uh, sorry 1000 to 500 5000 uh, meter square ponds are used in, in in current conditions coming to the closed system <clears throat> closed photoreactor offers high biomass productivity and better process control ability bio reactor is more expensive when compared to the uh, conventional raised pond system and they have the complex performance and maintenance they offers many advantages okay and photo reactors are ca- capable of minimizing the required space this is very important then and based on the construction besides controlling uh, oxygen temperature and contamination so okay normally when compared to the uh, open raised system so we uh, we suffer a lot with the uh, contamination so here we don't have that issues so both have like uh, you know ups and downs like uh, advantage and disadvantage it uh, depends upon the for example if you go for like uh, products like uh, high value added products uh, i think a closed reactor system would be the best options excellent please this slide shows that uh, entire algal bio refinery so here you in the left hand side you can see different uh, like waste water resource because uh, waste water is major issues right now and uh, how this waste water can be converted because after the treatment like primary and secondary treatment you can use the waste water for microalgal cultivation at large scale using open raised pond or photo bio reactor systems so it uh, you know it uh, takes uh, the carbon dioxide like uh, as i d- told you earlier that to grow 1 kg of algal biomass it require 1.8 kg of carbon dioxide so and we get from this waste because this is like a integrated bio refinery system like uh, we are going to convert all the waste into valuable bio, bio products 
uh, after getting the algal biomass you can go for a direct use like animal feed like shim you can use it or some other nutritional food for animals and you can after processing the bi uh, biomass you can go for like biofuels and value added products like biomethane biohydrogen bioethanol and bio uh, gas something like that and the other thing is like value added uh, products like anti cancer anti cancer drugs antimicrobial drugs and uh, anti uh, oxidant cosmetic products vitamins and so on so next slide please and coming to the biofuels uh, i think most of the research have uh, covered this topic that uh, algal biofuels normally algal biofuels is derived from biological material through the uh, conversions like different conversion process like biochemical or thermochemical conversions and this is renewable fast and easy way for bioenergy productions using bioresource and can significantly reduce the gas emissions and foreign oil dependency and this this is the, like different types of biofuels like ethanol uh, uh, diesel and gasoline so on so next slide please and this is a very important part of this uh, uh, talk that how this microalgae is going to play a vital role in pharmaceutical industries and nutraceutical industries because right now this pharmaceutical nutraceutical industries are the major uh, you know uh, due to the covid and other you know issues okay so here the uh, astaxanthin uh, hematococcus the, uh, because there are so many algae uh, you know plays a vital role in uh, pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industry for example everyone familiar with the spirulina and uh, hematococcus for astaxanthin and dunalilla for uh, beta carotene production sir so i'm going to talk about only the uh, natural astaxanthin production uh, from hematococcus i think uh, this is very important that what is astaxanthin astaxanthin is a blood red pigment it is called as keto carotenoid super antioxidant a natural originate from the microalgae called hematococcus uh, species uh, this kind of uh, astaxanthin also plays you know uh, found in some other uh, um, Uh, like a uh, sea uh, sea animals okay but uh, algae why algae is uh, uh, for good for uh, astaxanthin production is because already reported that algae can produce 7 to 8 uh, percentage of uh, astaxanthin okay based on the dry weight cells so this is such a huge huge amount so that's why instead of going for other uh, you know alternative source the most of the research are focusing on microalgae for astaxanthin production so okay so next slide please the potential benefits of microalgae hematococcus in medicinal applications here microalgae derived natural astaxanthin is a keto carotenoid with a strong antioxidant and anti inflammatory activities known for you know this is like like a, a health promoting and clinical benefits okay and clinically natural astaxanthin has shown diverse benefits with excellent safety and it's reported to block oxidative uh, dna damage and lower c reactive proteins that is uh, crp and other inflammatory inflammation biomarkers some studies reported that natural astaxanthin exceed positive effect uh, in alleviating the cytokine st storm because this is very important uh, uh, study for the covid situation and also it plays a vital role in acute lung injury and other things okay so other medical medicinal application of uh, astaxanthin from microalgae hematococcus derived Uh, natural astaxanthin has various biological activities it has been demonstrated that both preclinical yes, please your time is already yeah. over yeah. yes sir one minute sir you can go other slide sir okay and this slide shows that uh, different applications of uh, astaxanthin how they are uh, potentially uh, benefit for the uh, human uh, you know different uh, things including skin uh, brain and other things and this slide shows a market value okay this slide shows a market value of uh, uh, astaxanthin in global ma market synthetic made astaxanthin has reached its share 95 percentage and it, the main reason is low price like uh, 100 000, 1000 usd per kilogram whereas the natural astaxanthin cost is around like 30000 usd per kilogram not only 30000 it can reach like 70000 usd per 1 kilogram depends upon the purity also it has been reported that the natural astaxanthin uh, received a lot of attention because uh, it shows 50 times stronger antioxidant property than the synthetic one besides natural astaxanthin also plays a human role in pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industries okay next slide please uh, coming to the conclusion um, biofuel can provide uh, 27% of world transportation fuel by 2050 this is uh, by uh, ea ea <coughs> iea port says and how are most of the biofuel production tilted uh, from the crops uh, that can be used for food or uh, some fuel feed helpful in developing an integrated bio refinery for sustainable production so biofuels and value added products coupled with waste water treatment and co2 mitigations is a very important part 
also this uh, research can reduce the dependency on the uh, crude oil and also uh, energy country's energy security and create new employment opportunity thank you very much for your kind attention thank you sir micro lp in one presentation basically one technique was discussed and in second that how how different kind of value added products fuel etc can be obtained from the micro lp so thank you very much the next uh, presentation that is the you can say show stopper presentation uh, that is by dr eldon raj rene dr eldon raj rene is presenting uh, working as Senior lecturer at Institute of uh, uh, IHE Delft, that is Institute for Water uh, Education, Delft, Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rene has obtained uh, his uh, teaching qualification from IHE Delft itself, and his PhD in chemical engineering from IIT Madras. The broad areas of research of Dr. Elder. Uh, they are related with some uh, resilient biological treatment processes for uh, waste water, some waste gas treatment, the development of uh, waste to energy conversion technologies, and the use of AI tools for environmental monitoring and environment process control. Uh, Dr. Eldon uh, has taught more than 4,500 MS and PhD students in uh, major international events uh, in different workshops and in conferences. He has published about 275 uh, research articles in different journals, 30 book chapters, 4 books and more than 100 uh, presentations in the international conferences of repute. Dr. Eldon, I welcome you to this 6th C conference. Uh, that is presently going on in India at Lucknow. So you can have your presentation. Please take care of the time you give. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Professor VK Garp, for your very nice introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers of the International Society for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability for giving me this opportunity, and especially Professor Ashok Pandey and Professor Sunita Varjani for, uh, for inviting me. And my topic is titled Resource Recovery from Methanol and Selenate Contaminated Waste Streams Using Anaerobic Bioreactors. So we, we work in collaboration with different, uh, different partners in the EU, which is part of the Erasmus Mundus uh, PhD program. And, and we have developed several bioreactor configurations, including batch and continuous reactors for resource recovery. So in this line, I would like to present a few case studies of batch and uh, continuous experiments where we, we try to remove uh, methanol emissions from pulp and paper industry and we also try to remove selenate and sulfate containing wastewater together or in as a standalone pollutant. So the, uh, in the introductory slide, I would like to highlight the, the importance of this pulp and paper industry. As we all know, it's one of the worst or highly polluting uh, industry in terms of uh, emissions and nearly 55,000 tons of methanol were emitted only in the United States in 2017. And the well-known process, the craft mill process for pulp and paper in the pulp and paper industry, it also contributes to a lot of COD. Okay, so when we have a lot of COD, it is very obvious that we can go for anaerobic bioreactor configurations and we can convert this carbon that is present in this uh, effluent into, of course, uh, methane, or we can also convert it into other value added uh, products. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the chemical pulping process. Um, at the top uh, left hand side, you can see all the physical processes such as bark, uh, wet barking, debarking, size reduction, mechanical pulping. Then when we go uh, for the chemical pulping, then we have the different types of uh, condensates that are produced. And then we deal with the pulp. We go for bleaching, the bleach pulp, and of course, we also have different pollutants such as methanol, ethanol, and these are, uh, it, it also contains um, volatile inorganic compounds like these um, dimethyl sulfide. And it also contains a lot of volatile organic compounds that is in the form of methanol, ethanol, 
are alpha pine. So, uh, so that is again a, diff a difficult tell in organic or organic compounds because there is no uh, that you cannot uh, you cannot use one microorganism to treat such kind of pollutants. So it's a complex mixture of, mixture of pollutants where the pollutant is present in the gas phase as well as in the liquid phase. Next slide, please. So um, in, in this work, we focused on two different sulfur um, and selenate compounds. Um, and the sulfur um, oxy anions of sulfur, such as sulfate or thiosulfate, and these are common constitutions of chemical pulping, petroleum refinery, and also the mining industry effluents. So in, in, in our case, we took um, different sulfur compounds and also selenium compounds. Next slide, please. And so the first, uh, in the first study, we did batch studies for selenate and thiosulfate reduction. So you can, as you all know, we, for any uh, biological system, we deal with carbon to nitrogen ratio or CO2 to sulfate ratio. So in the same way, when you have selenate compounds, you can also uh, manipulate the COD to sul uh, the sulfate ratio or COD to selenate ratio. So in this case, we change the ratios from 6, 12, and 13. 13, whereas for thiosulfate and sulfate, we also varied it uh, between uh, at, at rather uh, lower ratios. Next slide. And so this is one of the, the results that we observed for batch, um, batch reduction. And we did these incubations for roughly around 45 days. And you can see that the um, at the top graph on the right side, you can see the methanol. Methanol is, is quite an easily degradable organic pollutant. So its concentration was almost reduced to, to zero. Whereas in the case of selenate, the, the um, selenate was not completely reduced. And the presence of selenate at concentrations greater than 10 milligram per liter, it started already to, to inhibit the methanogens. So, and the methanol was rather utilized by the estrogens for VFA production. So that is what you see here. We were able to produce VFA from methanol in the presence of selenate. So, of course, we have the electron donor, electron acceptors. And in this case, we were able to steer the pathway more towards VFA production. The next slide. And uh, this is another slide that shows thiosulfate. Thiosulfate is S2O3, 2 minus. One of the problem with uh, these sulfur compounds is at different pH, they would also uh, not only transform, but they would also speciate. So that is what we also observed here. The, the disproportionation reaction from selenate to thiosulfate also started to uh, increase. Next slide. And the final part, what we, I wanted to show is a very excellent reactor configuration that I that we always promote. That is the biotrickling filter, which we had developed. And this is this bioreactor configurations can be used for the simultaneous reduction of pollutants present in the waste gas as well as in wastewater. So in this case, we took selenate. No, the previous slide. Yeah. We took selenate in the in the liquid phase, whereas the gas phase methanol was passed to the reactor in an upflow mode. So when you have this upflow mode, as well as the continuous feeding of selenate from the top of the reactor, it, it really facilitates an excellent mass transfer. So we, we were able to promote the countercurrent uh, type of operation. And for gas, for the gas phase pollutant, it was also, it behaved as an ideal plug flow reactor. So can you go to the next slide? And what we found was anaerobic re removal of continuously gas-fed uh, methanol was observed with the step fed of thiosulfate. And we did it at different residence times. And you can see here, the residence time of this biotrickling filter was 2.3 minutes. In any uh, wastewater treatment systems, we normally talk about hydraulic retention time of hours or or few hours or minutes, but um, a few hours normally. But in this case, we will be, we were able to, go down further up to 2.3 minutes. But this is still not the optimum conditions, but there are also biotrickling filters with only gas phase pollutants that can go up to even residence time as low as 10 seconds. Okay, so these are high rate systems, which I think which has excellent mass transfer properties. And it can also be used for the simultaneous removal of volatile organic compounds, volatile inorganic compounds, and also the continuous production of VFAs. 
So here you can see here on the left side, it's the inlet and outlet concentration of methanol. Whereas in the right hand side, you can see the methanol removal efficiency in blue was rather high. Um, according to my understanding or observation, we were able to get more than 60 to 70 percent removal. Although in some cases we were not able to get an ideal steady state. And I will tell you the reason why from in the next slide. So in the next slide, please. In the next slide, you can see here that we were we did not pass the thiosulfate continuously, whereas it was passed in a fed batch mode, which means once the concentration dropped to zero, then we passed it again. So that is what you see, this vertical profile that from a certain initial concentration, it went up to zero, then we passed it again. So, so whenever the thiosulfate concentration went to zero, we were able to see the methanol concentration also dropping down. So it was quite evident that that the, the COD to selenate ratio was also important for the production of EFA or for the utilization of methanol. So what we observed here was a higher production of acetate and, um, and also of course we had other, um, other VFAs that were also produced. Yeah, next slide please. Yeah, next. Yeah, so, so coming back to this, we were able to achieve rates that were as high as eight milligram per liter a day, which was also uh, in comparison with what was reported in the literatures for other bioreactor configurations. And the selenate was also recovered as uh, selenium. The next slide. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, give a take home message. That is the last point here that selective recovery of the individual VFA is also possible that we can, we can have an adsorption unit as a downstream step for example, it can be an anion exchange resin through which we can also recover VFA. And I would still, with this um, uh, presentation, I would like to promote the technology of biotripping filter for simultaneous gas as well as liquid treatment. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful uh, presentation that uh, how the things can be recovered from the methanol and uh, selenate contaminated water. So in this session, we had a total of seven panelists. Some of them talked about uh, different kinds of biosources and some talked about some particular techniques or uh, processes. So next few minutes we can spend uh, on the queries or some kind of question or some kind of clarification which uh, the panelists have to each other as well as uh, the audience that is available online as well as offline. Uh, so if you have any question, anyone, uh, please. Yeah, so we have one question. Uh, uh, please uh, first tell your name and institute and then you can go ahead with your question, please. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Piyali Das. I am from TV, New Delhi. So I have one question to uh, Dr. Sanabama Guru and another question to Dr. Dicha Kutani. So uh, to Dr. Murugan, my question is like uh, your work is really very really good and uh, it's uh, very, uh, I think, uh, timely and uh, need of the hour actually, this literature is this. So I'm really, very, really, uh, I must say I appreciate the work you have done. And uh, but one uh, like uh, mostly a uh, lot of work have done on the Japanese West countries. So at what scale at this moment you are you know, like, uh, working for this conversion? Uh, though uh, you have this pathways and all that is really ex uh, very uh, exciting. But uh, what about the economic sustainability sustainability of Japanese West countries uh, conversion processes? And uh, with what scale up to now you have reached? So if you can give some. The, the one, one uh, what related to using different classified that actually I did we did it in my uh, previous institute in that technology has been transferred to other parts of this market. Actually, what we did we did only in that scale, but now they are working uh, towards commercialization. That is the uh, production of metal lacking -like from sugars. Uh, in case of this zirconium based catalyst, of course you are right, it's not uh, cheaper compared to many other metal oxide systems. Uh, generally, in heterogeneous catalysis, if you take the most of the studies performed only under lab scale, there are a lot of steps, you know, 
going before uh, going towards commercialization, the major obstacle would be most to study not performing the continuous study to see the stability. Even the, our catalyst, what we develop, I have no idea. So it needs to be tested in a lot in a continuous study where we can see whether the catalyst is stable or not, whether it maintains the, uh, the selectivity of the particular product or not. So that we have not done yet. So we, will, we are looking for establishing a continuous flow reactor then we can. So what is the time that you yeah, it's very interesting question. Actually, if you, I have not shown uh, uh, several of our research. Actually, the major aim is to the utilization of biomass. Basically, we are working on rice flow in Mughali because I come from Punjab. So, the major uh, issue is that the stubble burning. So, we are already working on disintegration of high carbohydrates and lignin. And then we are integrating those substances already. We already obtained many cellulose separately and cellulose separately. That's why if you see my presentation all linked with the uh, uh, erotic compounds, which can be obtained from cellulose and many cellulose. So meantime, we are using a uh, model compound to stream. So it may take a few more years to you know integrate those processes and then we will see whether it can be accounted by the compound. Yes, uh, you have second question for. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, we have asked the second one. Uh, this is to Dr. Richa Kotari. Richa Kotari, I think you, this question is for you. Yeah, yes, Richa. sir. Yes, sir. I am here only. So, uh, uh, do, uh, are you doing any experimental work on the uh, HTL of algal uh, lipid or algal biomass? I just started because from last. Uh, 10 to 12 years, I am working on the algal uh, biomass processing for the bio oil content. With the uh, conventional processing, we have that uh, harvesting is there, then drying is there. But recently, I just started uh, within from last two years. So not the experimental results I have, but uh, from the literature I have uh, gone through and I am find that uh, this is more economical, uh, efficient, on the part of algal biomass to convert this into crude bio oil. Okay, because I myself work on a lot on the uh, algal conversion, uh, both through thermal, mostly through pyrotechnic way, but also we have started with hydrothermal. So there are some basic challenges uh, on uh, because in the hydrothermal, all the components in the crude oil get together with the solvent itself. So that uh, post uh, hydrothermal conversion, that separation. Uh, still, that I wanted to know actually about those separation processes. So you are uh, still you are just yet to do that uh, part. So it's okay. Yeah, I, I just started because from last ten to twelve years I am working on the, the, the trans transesterification process. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's as per the literature I have gone through that uh, there are a lot of challenges are there. Yeah, thank, you, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Yes, there's one question from uh, Dr. Sarun uh, Gupta. Yes. Uh, Hello. Uh, my question is for Dr. Ashok Kumar Veena Mutsu. If I'm correct, like, uh, you showed various applications of the product from bio algae. And yes, uh, one of the Ashok Kumar, uh, are you here, please? Yes, sir, I can hear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, my question is uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, this product has implications uh, from recent events uh, where cytochrome storm is one of the uh, problems with the COVID, like the way the body uh, react, overreact, and then it overwhelms the immune system. So, can you, uh, like, give clarification of how this product is helpful in overcoming this kind of uh, uh, immune response in the body. Yeah, th thank you very much for your question, sir. It is a very nice question. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, I, I think now uh, many of the microorganism species plays a vital role in uh, um, antiviral compound production. So, so in the industry also, you know, uh, started doing this uh, kind of research and specifically for this uh, COVID situation. Sir. So in this one, uh, uh, the microalgae spirulina, that is a cyanobacteria, 
and uh, you know the researcher started uh, extracting the most of the uh, wide, uh, important compounds from this uh, microalgae and they used for uh, uh, particularly for this uh, vi viral infections or other things and uh, right now we, in our laboratory we are not uh, uh, focusing on this uh, like uh, medicinal aspects but we are working on large scale productions of antioxidant uh, like uh, hematococcus uh, from hematococcus like uh, astaxanthin productions and we are going to start this uh, start up with the study regarding the uh, viral infection and other things but uh, sir can you hear me yeah okay uh, thank you, Dr. Ashok Kumar. I think there is one more question from uh, Dr. Nitin Hitch from Miri Nasu. Dr. Nitin, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Nitin Nasu from Miri. My uh, question or comment to Dr. Ayer you know, from IIT Delhi. Dr. Ayer, your question is for Dr. Ayer? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Ayer, I think uh, you are here now. Dr. Ayer? Yes. Yes, yes, I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. This question is for you. Thanks for the very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we are probably using the celery as a homogeneous character for this work. So I have two uh, comments. I mean, one is uh, how about the recovery of selenium because it is uh, abundant at a very, very low level, even at OPP level, that's number one. Number two, it has an affinity of uh, very good affinity of yeah. the iron based materials. So if uh, the base water or water contains iron, normally it gets stepped to the iron. And third is uh, probably in the northern India in Punjab, uh, nowadays a uh, lot of selenium is present in the water and released water. So that can have consequences on what you are trying to explain in the synthetic uh, uh, you know, like conditions. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your very nice question. So, yeah. So, uh, to answer to the first question, um, with respect to the recovery of selenium yeah we have tried a lot of uh, biological routes as well as also uh, chemical uh, routes so uh, the first uh, thing is is also the production of elemental sulfur it can be intracellular or, uh, or else it can also be extracellular in the case of intracellular you really need to disrupt the cell wall and for that you have to go for a two step process whereas you also um, uh, firstly we tried with sonication and then we also went for uh, extraction with hexane. So that is how we were able to recover the elemental self, uh, selenium. But I fully agree with you that it's in very low, low uh, quantities. So, for example, the commercial recovery of selenium yeah, would still really need much more techno-economic analysis. And with respect to your uh, second question about the presence of iron species, with respect uh, com, uh, in uh, in addition to all these other compounds. But um, in, in our work, yeah, we did not observe, uh, we did not have iron or other competing uh, heavy metals that were present, but these were mostly lab scale studies that we did with only a single, um, sing, uh, with only multiple pollutants, because one of the problem that we had with uh, thiosulfate was also the disproportionation or the speciation at the pH at, with a pH change. So when we also have all these metal complexes or with, with all these iron, iron, partic iron, iron, iron rich um, waste water, then we would also have to first optimize for that as well as then to see all these metal to metal interaction or metal to microbe um, interactions. But with this, uh, with respect to iron, we did not uh, carry out experiments in our work. Dr. Alden, uh, with this uh, question, we have to end this uh, discussion uh, part because uh, we have now seven presentations by the students. Uh, I think uh, a sheet has been shared with all the panelists. Please evaluate mm -hmm. the students and uh, send the seat uh, to the organizers as directed. Based upon that, uh, they are going to give certain award to motivate the students. So, uh, are you ready for the student presentations? The first presentation is uh, by Deepak Das, Paramjit Singh Panesar and Chiranjeev Singh Saini. Yeah, paper number is 68. 68, The title is Characterization of Solemn in Isolate Extracted Through Ultrasound Treatment.
I am Deepak Das, going to give an oral presentation on characterization of soybean meal protein isolate extracted through ultrasound treatment. This is a type of PhD research work. Soybean meal is an abundantly available byproduct generated from soybean oil processing industry. 80% of the waste generated from soybean oil processing industry is soybean meal. It contains approximately 35 to 45% of protein. At first, soybean meal was collected from nearby industry of Punjab region. It was then taken to prepare soybean meal protein isolate by using alkali extraction method. Then ultrasound treatment was given at the extraction step for increasing the yield and purity of soybean meal protein isolate. Different parameters of ultrasound treatment was varied to get the optimum condition to prepare the soybean meal uh, protein isolate. Then the prepared uh, protein isolate was characterized to study different properties of soybean meal protein isolate. During the ultrasound treatment, solid liquid ratio, amplitude, temperature, pulse and time was varied and it was found that the solid liquid ratio at 15 is to 1, amplitude at 50%, temperature at 20 degrees centigrade, pulse at 100 cycle, time at 10 minutes given the better yield and purity. The prepared soybean milk protein isolate at optimized ultrasound treatment parameter was uh, characterized further and it was found that ultrasonically prepared soybean milk protein isolate given the better solubility, water and oil bending property and emulsion characteristics. Overall, it can be concluded that ultrasonication treatment improved the yield and purity of prepared soybean milk protein isolate and it also increased the functional properties of protein isolate which will be helpful for increasing the application of soybean meal protein isolate for developing different new food product. At last, I would like to acknowledge the AICT, Government of India, for providing financial support in the form of an IDA fellowship. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deepak. Can you hear my voice? Yes, sir. I can hear it. Yeah, there is a question for you. Yes. Sure, sir. Uh, please let us know yes, if uh, any other technology apart from ultrasound treatment can be used for this work. And uh, what is the rationale behind uh, choosing ultrasound treatment only? Ma'am, uh, I have uh, chosen three uh, different extraction uh, methods. Uh, first one is ultrasound, second is microwave, and uh, third one is uh, supercritical fluid extraction. Uh, then uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, my work, uh, uh, I have finished only with uh, this ultrasound treatment, and uh, I'm pro, uh, I'm under like uh, I'm going uh, for this microwave and uh, uh, this uh, supercritical fluid extraction method uh, in my uh, further uh, research work. And sir, and ma'am, uh, this uh, ultrasound treatment I have chosen because uh, as it as a green technology, uh, this method is uh, uh, most, uh, uh, this uh, method uh, was found most effective uh, according to the previous literature. Uh, and uh, still, uh, ma'am, uh, I have to evaluate, uh, uh, I have to compare in future whether uh, it will give uh, this uh, uh, purity in terms of purity and uh, uh, yield, whether it will give the highest uh, purity or yield uh, as compared to other like microwave and supercritical uh, fluid extractions. Um, I'm still uh, this work uh, have to be done. Thank you, Deepak uh, I request uh, panelists, please, if you have any question, you can put uh, directly uh, to the projector. Panelists, please. Okay. Hi. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
just now, I mean, uh, the presenter asked, I mean, uh, suggest about the use of uh, ultrasonification and also microwave, right? Since I'm very interested in microwave, what's your thought of using microwave? I mean, why you want to use microwave, actually? Thank you. Yeah, people ask, please. Uh, sir, uh, microwave uh, heating will, like, uh, when we'll uh, give the microwave uh, treatment uh, in our sample, then uh, it will uh, also, uh, as, a, as a green techniques, it will also be effective because uh, uh, under uh, microwave uh, treatment, the the this uh, uh, like uh, uh, during the heating process microwave heating process the, uh, the cell structure will damage and uh, it will uh, increase uh, increase the yield uh, as uh, it is happening in the ultrasound treatment that is why sir uh, i will go for microwave treatment as well okay thank you thank you thank you class uh, thank okay. you thank you. Uh, so the next presentation is by uh, deepak singh is uh, uh, number is 96. Hello, everyone. And then, uh, Deepak Singh. Yes. From the Department of Campaign and Hygiene. Today, I'm discuss about the investigation of the performance of a solar dryer mitigated with a PVT hybrid system for food preservation application. So as we know that uh, basically, regular, regular consumption of fruit and vegetables helps to uh, human to get the nutrients, micronutrients like vitamin and proteins from the uh, foods to human body. And uh, as we know that consumers means human, uh, expect every food producer or food company to deliver high quality product at a reasonable price. And um, we can see in these pictures, the market is fulfilled with the convenience of our processed food. And um, we have fabricated a, a setup, a solar dryer setup, in, integrated with a, a PVT a system. Here we can see this is a drying chamber, this is a solar collector, and uh, these are the this these are the, this are this is basically setup of the PVT uh, system. And one external agency that is exhaust fan is, has been also mounted on the top of the drying chamber of the solar dryer. So uh, this is the experimental process in the procedure in which we started from the sample collection from the uh, market of Lucknow. Uh, uh, we have used uh, potato as a food, food sample and uh, we have predated this uh, food sample into the laboratory by washing, drying, uh, sorry, by washing or we can say cutting into required shape and thickness. Then load the chamber, uh, load the sample in the drying chamber. As we know that continuous solar operation has been taking place and uh, parallelly we have uh, uh, monitored the or we have uh, uh, recorded the uh, solar glo global radiation or solar power, temperature of the food sample and weight or loss of the food sample from with the help of different agencies. These are the pro profiles uh, in which the global radiation versus uh, time we get maximum global radiation at 1 pm and if here we can you take two cases that is in case of natural convection and forced convection we get a huge difference in temperature and drying rate profile in case of forced con convection we get a maximum temperature and in case of uh, natural convection we get uh, less than uh, minimum or we can say less than uh, from the natural uh, convection so uh, now we talk about some conclusions so conclusion of my study is uh, by using the hybrid system the system we get approximate 13 degrees Celsius temperature difference from the uh, natural convection or in comparison to uh, natural convection. And we get a more efficient PVT system in comparison to uh, PVT system. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Deepak Singh, for this thank presentation. Uh, now, this is open for discussion, uh, and uh, I request the panelists to ask at least one question to the presenter. Panelist, please. Uh, yes, please. Can I ask a question? Thank you. Mm. Uh, yes, sir, sure. Uh, just, uh, just now you mentioned in your conclusion, like uh, some, I mean, something increased by 13 Celsius, right? Uh, can you elaborate a bit more yes, on that? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that it is, it is an advantage or what? Thank you. Uh, actually, sir, uh, when we modified our uh, solar dryer um, in terms of uh, when we uh, provide a uh, uh, external agency uh, that is uh, exhaust fan on the top of the uh, solar dryer. 
so uh, we simply increase the temperature of the food sample up to uh, 10 to 13 degree from the uh, in comparison to natural convection sir thank you okay. thank you thank you deepak singh uh, now the next presentation is number 114 uh, that is by jitendra singh jitendra singh you are available online for uh, question answers for this okay the theme of biology or biofuel the topic which i am going to present is consolidated in brass means from biofuel production using of biofuel and biofuel okay i just take a quick look on the background and significance of this investigation the more recently the brass is going to be according to the report of brazilian only 20% of the brass is used the predicament is followed by the inoculation of cells for cellulose production and thereby hydrolysis of nutritive dry bagas causes the production of sugars the sugars consumed by yeast to produce ethanol by the fermentation process now talking about compositional analysis in case of raw bagas about 0.67 gram by gram of hollow cellulose was obtained with only 0.5 gram by gram of cellulose however nutritive bagas contains 0.75 gram by gram of hollow cellulose and having 0.45 gram by gram of cellulose The lignification value of 72.58% was obtained, suggesting acid free treatment method caused the removal of hemicellulose and partial digestion of lignin. During XRD analysis, we observed increase in the value of crystallinity index for pre-treatment bagas sample, suggesting its increasing level of amorphous cellulose. FSM images suggested the increase in the porosity, surface area, and fibrous structure in case of pre-treated bagas. maximum beta glucose day is of 0.93 iu per ml fc is of 1.51 iu per ml cmc is of 7.23 iu per ml and xylene is of 4.95 iu per ml was observed at 288 hour time period hplc profile of hydrolysate reported the lower consumption of sugars and inhibitors in later time stage supported the cellulose production data during co-culturing of saccharomyces cerevisiae and feature stipites only 0.80 g per liter of ethanol was observed also prolonged hydrolysis for 48 hours produced around 1.2 g per liter of ethanol using only saccharomyces cerevisiae higher surface area and high biomass feeding might be the reason that caused the absorption of whole hydrolysate after 10% feeding at 288 hours thus causing lower saccharification and fermentation further studies are needed to explore all the factors affecting the ethanol production and sugar consumption thank you the panelists uh, to have the questions panelists please you want to ask yeah dr sabna want to ask a question you can know this is my nice presentation i have a question how much lignin you have removed And if not removed completely, how does that affect the biofuel production? Can you repeat the question? Uh, yes, Jitendra. Jitendra, can uh, uh, would you like the question be repeated for you? Yes, sir. Please. What is the amount of lignin removed from the sugar cane bagger? uh sir uh, it was it is already mentioned in the ppt that the delignification uh, percentage obtained by comparing the lignin removal from uh, from uh, a pretreated uh, bagas is around uh, is approximately around 80% so uh, acid pretreatment uh, is a a better approach to uh, go for the ethanol production thank you any other panelist please if have any question 
Okay. Thank you, Chitendra. So the next presentation is uh, number one one five by Monica Thakur. It's still on. My name is Monica Thakur, and today I am here to give my oral presentation entitled "Utilization of Potato Peel for Extraction of Starch and Azamity by Synthesis of Raisin Starch." To begin with this, India is the second largest producer of potato after China and thus generates huge quantity of peel uh, as a waste of zero value. Thus, it is desirable to evolve methods for transformation of peel waste into uh, value-added products. In view of this, in this study, we have converted peel starch into highly resistant starch and molto oligosaccharide molecule. Now, I am coming into resin starch. And its benefits. Resin starch is non-digestible part of starch. It has thick digestion in small intestine and enter into large intestine for uh, with nutritional value. Uh, on the basis of physical and chemical property, resin starch has been categorized into five different forms. In this study, we have uh, we have made a type three resin starch with high heat combustibility. It can withstand high temperature more than 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, in this study, firstly we took peel starch and starch was extracted by grinding and squeezing it. And after several washing, starch was extracted, and then uh, it was gelatinized at 70 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. Uh, and after this, debranching was done. Debranching was used using type 1 pulleries. Type 1 pulleries is an enzyme that catalyzes hydrolysis of alpha 1 6 linkage and thus generate linear fragment of polymer that is precursor for RS3 molecule. After this, it was retrograded. Retrograded is process of heating and cooling. Uh, during this process, a new structure is developed that is resistance against alpha amylase. And its characteristics was checked using different techniques that is TJ, XRD, and in vitro digestibility. During TJ, thermal stability was uh, increased as compared to native starch, and its crystallinity was also increased. And recent starch showed high resistance against alpha amylase as compared to native starch. Uh, the digestible part of starch was formed into multi oligosaccharide. Multi oligosaccharide is low uh, molecular weight carbohydrate that can be used as energy supplements for uh, athletes. This paper is published in Environment Technology and Innovation, and these are the highlights of study that is including development of fibrosis that can be used as alternative technology to valorize potato peel into functional byproducts. And it displayed high crystallinity, uh, resistance against sulfur amylase, and you know, high heat stability as compared to native starch. It also gave an idea to produce uh, food with incorporated starch that can give uh, helpful health effects like low bl blood plasma glucose and increased fecal bulk and short chain fatty acid to form infusion in large intestine. It also hardens potential synergy between type 3 resin starch and hard Dr. Sudhir Prasapsin and Faculty of CIPB, DBT, and my funding CCSI. Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you, Monica. Uh, is there any question from the audience for uh, Monica? Uh, yes. Uh, Monica, uh, yes, please. I like, yes, sir. I like your idea and also the content of your research, brother. So I just like to know Thank you, sir. Uh, what is the next step uh, to uh, move forward. Thank you. So, Ita, can you repeat? Uh, what is the next step to move forward for your research? Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm planning for uh, preparation of resin starch no, no, no. That is also one novel uh, insight into peel valorization. So I'm looking for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. The next presentation is by Shantanu Basak 119. Uh, Shantanu Basak is uh, not available online to take the questions. No, yes. oh, but, but we will play his video. Yeah. I am presenting on studies on sustainable approach for developing retardant textiles using plant-based biomicromolecules. When any textile material like cotton, jute, paper is heated, it reaches its pyrolysis temperature, and at this particular temperature of 350 degrees centigrade, toxic flammable gases, toxic organic volatiles have been released, and these gases, these toxic gases in presence of the heat and oxygen help to burn the material continuously. So these gases are very much dangerous to the end users 
and because of this we need to make the material flame retardant for any flame retardant material we should remember that ky value need to be more than 26 so that it can be considered as a flame retardant material so any cellulosic material like cotton jute it was showing the ky value around 18 it is a limiting oxygen index it is the minimum amount of the oxygen required for just burning of the sample when it is more it is the material means material is good flame retardant so a lot of lot of chemicals are available in, in the market for making the material flame retardant but in most of the cases material are synthetic and larger quantity of the material has been used to make the material flame retardant so uh, in our case we have used different wastage plant extract of banana pulp and oil extract and pomegranate oil extract to make the textile material flame retardant and to find out the The uh, uh, mechanism lies behind the flame retardant is the action of the cricket textile. First of all, we have optimized the detail extraction process and the treatment process on the textile substrate, and which has been found that concentration of around 400 GPL and the process condition 90 degrees and 30 minutes is ideal for making the textile material flame retardant with this type of wastage byproduct. and each extract has been characterized in detail before application on the cotton textile and if this is the scenario of after application of this extract on the cotton textile we have seen the increase of the pre treated pomegranate oil extract treated textile should put ly value of around 29 uh, and the reason behind this good ly value we have found out from the lcms analysis of the extract that it contains different branched polyphenolic compounds and in addition of it some tannin contains tannin compound and some gallic acid based tannin compounds are also present there so all these molecules combine dehydrate the cellulose structure and inhibit the polymerization process of the cellulose at particularly 350 degrees centigrade means it early at the pyrolysis condition and enhance the more amount of char formation at what temperature so for further improvement of the process we have mixed some equivalently sodium trichloride phosphate in the pomegranate oil extract and treated with the same process which i have mentioned up here it is a textile material the same process and we have found from the combustion test analysis that the rate of heat increase is around 50 to 60% lower compared to the control cotton fabric sample so we can conclude that addition of phosphorus chemical into the plant extract reduce the add on percentage and also the secondary part the textile mold in addition of it which is the showed earlier pyrolysis and more than more amount of the dehydration char formation at higher temperature thank you presentation next presentation is uh, number 1 2 3 uh, by saurabh gupta 1 2 morning everyone my name is saurabh gupta and uh, this pindar code they are also not available to take the questions i am yeah. the scholar from shri guru granth sahib world university fatehgarh sahib First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present our abstract and title: Screening and Isolation of Biosurfactant Producing Bacterial Strain Alkaline SS1. In this C, now what are surfactants? Surfactants are surface active compounds that lower the surface tension between two invasive materials. Now, what are the sources of surfactant? Plants and microorganisms are a good source of surfactant. About the properties of biosurfactants, surfactants are surface-active compounds with wide range of properties. Like they are non-toxic in nature, they are high biodegradability, effective critical mass concentration, and excellent surface activator. Taking a sample for the isolation of microorganisms, I am using a brain heart infusion broth in which one percent diesel oil are used. as a inducer volume by volume and for the screening of potential isolates e24 index method and do no ring method is used the different biochemical tests were performed and for the molecular characterization standard protocol fusion broth different biochemical test for performed and for the molecular characterization 
standard protocol is performed on the basis of gene sequencing in which universal primer is used and for the characterization of biosurfactants this data is based on the infrared spectrum analysis result and discussion i have total 65 strains in which 40 bacterial and 25 fungal strains were isolated different characteristics and observations like colony morphology its colony is whitish opaque and its margin is irregular in gram staining this uh, diagram show a gram negative rod shaped bacterial structure and uh, and next the when we talk about it is phylogenetic tree analysis of 16s rna sequence by blast method indicates 99% homology to alkali genes the ss1 uh, culture show more characteristics similar to alkali genes and in ftr analysis this graph represent new characteristics bands are observed in the ir spectrum of the isolate ss1 like n oh and uh, and nh stretchings uh, shows this indicate presence of alcohol phenol and secondary amines now conclusion the biosurfactant from microbial source has a great importance in this study culture was characterized physiologically biochemically and phylogenetically after blast analysis and this is assigned as a alkali gene species under accession number 4804562 and the media optimization and subculturing for biosurfactant producing bacterial strain ss1 is under progress these are references of different research papers which i have searched for my presentation in the last i want to thank my all team members this project is totally a team work and firstly i want to thank my supervisor dr pindarpal singh he is head of food processing and technology department in shri guru granth sahib world university fatehgarh sahib secondly my co supervisor dr swarup gupta he is head of microbiology department in mata gushi college fatehgarh sahib and special thanks to my lab mate mr harpal singh and thank you so much everyone Uh, thank you and uh, she is not uh, available online to the questions the next uh, presentation number is 141 by punam kumari monopati hemlata uh, then uh, welcome to mohan at all or anyone from this group is available online to take the questions can they say yes if available Hello everyone. I am Pulam Kumari. I am from CSR ICT. Today I am presenting on algae-based bioplastics, mixotropic production, and life cycle analysis. Uh, molecule of my concern is PHP. PHP is a kind of a polyhydroxy alkaloids that have a uh, that are immersed as the bioplastic, and uh, PHPs are a short chain uh, short chain length. monomers of phs so here uh, here in our methodology i have tried we have tried to explore the chlorella sorokiniana for its potential for the production of the phps coming to the experimental methodology we have grown the chlorella uh, sorokiniana uh, fresh biomass in the in the two phases both was in the bold phase and medium only but the stress phase was deprived of the nit uh, nitrate uh, but nitrate concentration and the cod was maintained up to 3000 mg per liter and the both phases was having a growth period of 8 days and the inoculum which was grown in the growth phase was inoculated for the stress phase coming to the extraction procedure uh, extraction of a php was done using the pre treatment of acid base and the um, extraction with chloroform and then the precipitation using the acetone the FTI graph of the extracted product shows the peak at the 1700 per centimeter absorbance peak that confirms the uh, that confirms the presence of the ketone group uh, ketone group in the product and the nile red staining shows the uh, accumulation of a uh, biopolymers coming to the results and discussion uh, biomass growth chlorophyll protein carbohydrate shows uh, Good increment in the growth phase, while in the stress phase, orbit these parameters became steady. Coming to the photosynthetic transist, single pam dual pam was uh, being analyzed for the uh, initial, you know, uh, 
initial culture and at the end of the growth phase and the stress phase growth phase shows the maximum electron transport rate and quantum yields which was also uh, visible um, in the fp fm fm ratio that shows the non photosynthetic quenching that the, it is having a maximum efficiency other than the others as it, as it was expected a life cycle uh, assessment was done for the same and it shows the electricity being used in the centrifugation and uh, and other methods this is having a maximum impact as well as the um, solvents being used for the extraction was having a environmental impact so in our upcoming studies we will try to optimize these conditions so that we can have a more more sustainable methods thank you thank you uh, uh, is uh, punam kumari available uh, no so friends uh, thank you very much uh, for this session to conclude this session if i present a brief summary in this session we had uh, a total of seven panelists from different parts of the world and we had seven presentations from uh, students uh, among them four were available online to take the questions uh, from the panelists and uh, from the audience uh, there was first presentation by dr lan uh, he discussed the technology that is uh, microwave technology then we had two presentations by dr park and uh, dr sarvana on catalytic pyrolysis and nitrogenous catalysis that fourth presentation uh, was by dr richa kothari that was also on a technique that is hydrothermal uh, liquefaction next was continuation of this uh, that was by dr ashok kumar and uh, that was on microalgae means two on microalgae uh, and uh, two on catalytic pyrolysis then uh, one presentation was by dr andan raj that was on the resource recovery from uh, this contaminated uh, this methanol and salinate contaminated waste stream and one presentation uh, that was on uh, economic ecno technical aspects uh, uh, that was by dr uh, baskar so in this session we had a total of uh, seven uh, uh, you can say presentations so mainly this session focused on uh, Thermo chemical conversion of different kinds of biomasses, waste materials to biodiesel, biochar, oil products, methanol, this uh, then aromatics, methanol, etc. And I hope those attended this uh, session, they have got certainly some feed for their brain uh, for next few days to think over these techniques and these processes, as well as I am of very confirmed opinion. that this session would help to bridge the knowledge gap and as well as certain perspectives have been highlighted by the learned panelists in the related research fields and i am thankful to all those uh, presenting and those attending this session have a nice day stay safe thank you very much over to the organizers thank you professor garg and professor you for uh, sharing the session moderating the session and uh, i am grateful to uh, professor baskar gurunathan professor lam dr s saravana murugan uh, professor park dr nicha kothari dr ashok kumar viramuthu and professor elder gane uh, to share their knowledge in their respective fields and enriching the knowledge of the audience now i request professor ashok pandey uh, to come uh, to felicitate our moderators and panelists i request professor vinod to okay. Uh, 
I request Dr. Saravana Murugan to go on as the virtual panelists uh, will be felicitated by the society once they attend the conference physically. Thank you, everyone. Now uh, we are having a tea break, and uh, after that, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. We have a validity session and I invite you all to please attend the validity session. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes,